I'm excited. Today is Dedication Sunday. We are dedicating our new edition. Are you excited about that? I'm excited. That's, I think that's a really cool thing. It's just really exciting to know that we are doing this new edition. It's a, it's a really great thing to, to think, you know, we're planning for the future church. We're going to be meeting the needs of our church it, today and in the future. I mean, um, we're, we're just excited to get rid of the ugly portable. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> God deserves better than a trailer. Doesn't he? I mean, that, that, that's worth amen right there. If you take nothing else home today, take that home. He deserves better than a trailer, and we're planning for that. We're going to glorify him uh, in a way that, uh, that he, can, he can be proud of. He can be proud of, or at least it would be better. It may not be Solomon's temple, but it will be better, all right? We're excited about it. And, and, and we, today, we're, we're in Nehemiah, and I think it's great. The Lord, the Lord leads us. This whole day is about leadership. This whole day, uh, we're starting Timothy tonight, and, um, and th this morning we're continuing Nehemiah, and it matters how we lead. It matters how we begin a project. It matters how we begin. How we begin matters. The roots are more important than, a bran than the branches. The roots are more important than the branches, and the foundation is the most important part of the building. That's why we've been talking about the, the, the man who listens to these words of Jesus Christ. He is a man who built his house on the rock. It matters what we build our lives on. How we start the building truly, truly matters. I can give you a simple illustration from my own life. I'm sure by looking at me, you can tell that I like some sweets. <laughs> you can tell that I like to have, actually, it's not the sweets that get me. I'll just admit it. It's not that. It's just, it's all the other stuff. It's like French fries. That's what kills me. French fries kill me. French fries and hamburgers. I'm not the guy who goes after the chocolate. I'm the guy who just has to have more French fries. Or I'm the guy that, you know, that like the, you know, the late, they goes, you want fries with that? And I, and I go, absolutely. And they go, really? <laughs> and I, aren't you too old to be getting french fries <laughs> and I'm like but I like them and I know something about diets I do I know something about them it, you know theoretically <laughs> intellectually I know something about them all right and what I know is if we if I start a diet tomorrow I will not stay on that diet <laughs> because how we start the diet matters. And if I start the diet in procrastination, the diet will end in defeat. <laughs> I'm just telling you, that's, that's my experience with diets. When I say, well, I'm going to go on a diet next week, that diet's got no chance. <laughs> it's got no chance. Because it only matters when, when I'm really convicted and when I say, I'm, I am on a diet now, at this moment, right now, yesterday, I'm on a diet. That's when it sticks. That's when it matters. Because it matters how we start. It truly matters how we start. We looked at Nehemiah in the beginning of this great project, this, the beginning of this great project of rebuilding the kingdom of God, Israel, rebuilding Jerusalem, rebuilding the walls of this great city of God. And how did Nehemiah begin that great project? Who was listening? Thank you. Say it. Prayer. The project begins with prayer. If you want to start well, we begin with prayer. Nehemiah chapter 1, he begins praying. What does he pray for? We're just reviewing last week's message, but it is the first point in this week's message because it's that important. Prayer is, is a mark of Nehemiah's life. If you want to start your project well, you start with prayer. He prayed a prayer of repentance. He prayed a prayer of favor, and he prayed a prayer of change. Repentance, favor, and change. Could we use some of that in the United States of America? Amen. Yeah. We need to pray prayers of repentance, favor, and change. That is the only way 
That is the only way the great tasks that are set before us in our families, in our communities, in our churches, and in this nation will happen is if we begin to pray. Pray. Pray with me, brothers and sisters, for a great revival. We desperately need it. It's a good place for an amen, Ramona. Thank you. <laughs> we desperately need it, don't we? We need revival. We need revival. We need God to move. And that only begins with prayer. But let me, let me say that the applications of Nehemiah go beyond revival. They go beyond uh, uh, maybe even just building the, the kingdom. They can go on and on. And in lots of areas, you could apply these some simple principles. So I'll, I'll just ask you this question. What task do you want to accomplish? Just think about that for a moment. What task do you want to accomplish? Do you have, are there, are you have some goals? I hope you've got some goals. Do you have some goals? Now, seriously th sit there and I, maybe even write them down on your bulletin if you have a pen. Maybe just right now, I want you to just reflect, but this is just between you and God. What are your goals? What do you want to do this month? This year, in the next five years, in the next 10 years, maybe before, you, before Jesus comes or before you die, what do you want to accomplish? Do you have any goals? Or are you just floating around and just going wherever the wind blows and it just doesn't matter? You got no goals whatsoever. You should have some goals. I hope you have some goals. Spiritually and physically and emotionally, I hope you have some goals for your life as a person. No, this, and this isn't even that. I'm not, this isn't, I'm not even preaching this gospel here. I'm just saying I hope you want to do something with this life. I hope you're not content to sit on the couch and just watch these nonsense TV shows every night, and that's going to be your life. I hope you have some goals to make a difference. Maybe you want to write those down. Maybe you want to start praying about it. Maybe you go, I don't, I don't think I have any goals. Well, guess what? I don't care what your goals are. I don't care what you want to accomplish. You begin with prayer. You begin with prayer. I don't care if you're simply talking about, I want to go to college, or I want to finish this class, or I want to uh, be a better friend to my friends, or I want to be a better father, or I want to be a better mother. I want to get a promotion. I, want to, I don't care what it is. You begin with prayer. Sometimes God will tell you, you have the wrong goal. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes we take goals to God that he says, this is not something I'm helping you with. <laughs> you ever done that? I have so done that many times. Say, hey, God, I want your blessing and favor. I've got this big plan. And God goes, you have a plan. <laughs> he said, why don't you join me in my plan? <laughs> join me in my plans for your life. Instead of making your plans, we need to join God in his plans. And we start joining him with prayer. That's why we will start this edition with prayer. At the end of this service, we're going to go out there, we're going to stand around the perimeter of the, the building that will be there, and we're going to pray over that place. We're going to pray for God's blessing. We're going to pray over the children and the adults that will meet Jesus right there in what currently is a parking lot. We're going to pray over that place. I just, I, I, I've just been so blessed to think about recently that in 2015, we have seen in this place, on this land, 51 decisions for Jesus Christ. Yeah, we can do some clapping. We can do some, woo! I mean, there's about 50 people here now. 51 decisions for Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, I believe that to be the seed of a revival. I believe that God is starting something here. He is starting something. And maybe, and maybe we'll see 51 decisions in that edition in 2015 and 2016. So we're going to pray over that place. Nehemiah prayed. And what did he, just reviewing chapter 1. Do you remember what he received? When he prayed, he prayed and he received, because he prayed, he received the blessing of permits, he, he received the materials, he even received housing for himself and protection, a garrison of soldiers that would go with him because he prayed. 
Then he gets to Jerusalem. I hope you have your Bibles. We're going to be in chapter 2. I'm going to start in verse 11. So Nehemiah then travels to Jerusalem. So I went to Jerusalem, and I was there for three days. I want you to notice the three days. He was there for three days. Then I rose at night, and, and I and a few men with me, and I told no one what God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. I didn't tell anybody what I was doing, and I was there for three days. There was no animal but, uh, with me but the one in which I rode, and I went out by night to the valley gate, to the dragon spring, and to the dung gate, which I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down, and its gates had been destroyed by fire. 15, 14 and 15 say the same thing. He goes basically, he goes out at night, and he just does a good inspection of the walls. He's there for three days. For three days, what's he doing? He's just checking things out. For three days, he doesn't tell anybody what he's about to do. For three days, he's just looking around. He's just evaluating. He's testing. He's inspecting. Why? What's he doing? He's planning. He's planning. He's looking at the gates and going, oh, this one needs help. This one needs help here. This one, um, we're going to have to tear that down. Uh, this one, I think we could fix with, you know, duct tape, because uh, <laughs> duct tape fixes everything. This one, I don't know what we're doing with it. We're going to send Pastor Glenn over there. <laughs> this one, he's making a plan. He's checking it out. He's inspecting. He plans for three days. And so let me say, if you want to start well, and again, I don't want to tell us our great, our great call, our great task is to build the kingdom of God here on this earth as it is in heaven, but it doesn't matter. I don't care if it's a spiritual task or it's just a fleshly task. It should begin with prayer, and it should secondly start with planning. You have to have a plan. You are gonna, it's going to take some, and we need some planners. Don't we need plan? I mean, we really, as a country, as a country and as a people, we could use a few planners because it just seems like nobody plans for anything. It's like we're all just riding by the seat of our pants. We have no idea where we're going. We have no idea what's going to happen. We don't care. We have no plans. I don't have, I don't, we don't have a clue. Well, next year, I don't know what's going on next week. Why not? Why do you have no idea what you're going to do? We need some planners. The Proverbs speaks about this. Proverbs says, and I, I'm going to use the New Living Translation because I like it, <laughs> and I like what it says. It says, uh, Pro, uh, Proverbs 6, 6 says, we can learn a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. I, I like that about the Living Translation. It makes, it makes it real. Some of these, you know, they'll say sluggard, you sluggard. And we don't feel bad because we don't know what that means. We go, sluggard, no one uses sluggard. How about a lazy bones? He says, why don't you learn from the ants, lazy bones? Learn from the ants. Without having a chief or a ruler, she prepares her bread in the summer. She gathers food in the harvest. Nothing happens if we don't plan. We need some plans. We could, we could, we could learn from these little bugs. They have it figured out that they need to store food for the winter. So many of us, we've got no plan, no idea. What we're doing next year, next month, when I graduate, when after I get out of college, we've got no idea how I'm going to live after this. I've got no idea how I'm going to retire. I don't have any idea what my kids are going to do. I don't have any idea what I'll do when my child is this age or that age. I've got no idea. I'm not making any plans. And I want to tell you, the Bible teaches us we should be planners. We should be planners. In fact, Jesus says this exact thing. In fact, and this never happens in a Baptist church. This never happens in almost any church, let me just say. Jesus has an invitation. Come. Come as you are. You know, when I was a kid, it was always just as I am. Right? You remember that? Right. We don't do it like one anymore much. Someday we should do that one. It would just be fun. We'd all, we'd all you know, raise our, our lighters and sing Kumbaya. It would be great. But anyways, um, <laughs> and, so, and there's an invitation. And people come, and they go, Jesus, I want to get saved. You know what Jesus says? Jesus says, have you really thought this through? Are you really ready to be a follower of Jesus Christ? No pastor ever says that. You've never seen a pastor go, wait, 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 wait. At the altar, right? Come, come, wait, wait, wait. I'm not sure you've thought this decision about Jesus through. You've never seen a pastor. Has anyone seen a pastor do that? No. 
but Jesus did that. Jesus said in Luke chapter 14, he said, count the cost. Think about whether you are really ready to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Consider, this will take hard work. Count the cost. Are you ready for this commitment? Have you planned for this commitment? Because the being a follower of Jesus Christ will take a lifelong commitment. A lifelong commitment. That means when you're young, you'll be committed to serve Jesus Christ. That means when you're middle-aged, you'll be committed to serve Jesus Christ. That means when you're retired, you'll be committed to serve Jesus Christ. Are you ready for that commitment? That's what Jesus has called us to. He's called us to be servants, but he's also called us to plan for it. Don't plan that someday you'll be done. I do say that. I do say that knowing that I have a bunch of baby boomers in the room. But, and, and I know I'm too young to speak that wisdom into your life, so I hope that God will say it to you. Do you really plan that someday you'll just be done serving Jesus? I don't plan that for myself. I hope that I go out serving Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. That's what we're called to. We're called to serve Jesus with everything. Come on in, brother. He's looking at me like, just you sit down in the back. And I've already made you a spectacle. I'm sorry. Just sit down. All right. <laughs> Are you ready? Are you ready to plan? To plan. Do some planning. You guys remember A-Team? You guys remember the A-Team? I used to love the A-Team. Who remembers the A-Team? With Mr. T and B.A. Baracus and Hannibal and what was Mr. T's name? Oh, B.A. Baracus. What was the other guy's name? And Murdoch, right? And Murdoch was the crazy guy. I loved Murdoch. I actually wrote Murdoch as a kid. And <laughs> I did. I wrote Murdoch as a kid, and I wanted his autograph. I said, would you just send me your autograph? I think you're awesome. You, that just tells you something about the psychology of Pastor Tim. I thought Murdoch was awesome. <laughs> I didn't like Mr. T. It wasn't about Hannibal. Hannibal was the leader, though. And Hannibal was the guy who made all the decisions. And remember what Hannibal used to say all the time? H Hannibal would say, don't you love it? When a plan comes together. You guys remember, 25 years later, isn't it amazing the stuff we remember, right? <laughs> when a plan comes together. But guess what? We're not to love it when a plan comes together. We're to love it when we had a plan beforehand. Yeah. We shouldn't be scrambling at the last minutes of, of our life going, what do we do? What do we need a plan? Uh, would you do this and I need this and I've got to buy this? We don't want to live life like that. We need to live life in a way that we are ready. We are planfully ready. Don't think that we just sprung this edition. We've been talking about this edition as elders for six, seven, eight months. We didn't just all of a sudden decide last month, let's build a building. <laughs> it takes planning. It takes time. We need to make plans. America is littered with the ruins of half-hearted good intentions. And we as believers, we as Christians, we need to inspect the walls of our lives. We need to inspect the walls. We need to do some planning. Because if we would do some inspection, what is that inspection about? It's just observation, using your eyes, looking around and seeing how life goes. Just use some observation skills. Look around, survey America, survey Central Point, survey Southern Point, survey Ohio, see where you live. If we would simply take a survey, an observation, a little research, we would understand the task that it's hand, is at hand. And the task at hand would tell us that work is hard, right? I mean, if we just look around, work is hard. Work will be work. Your boss will be a jerk. That's just, I mean, that's an observation. Doing the right thing is always hard. Amen? Nothing good comes easy. People will disappoint you. Children will be disrespectful. Wives and husbands will be unfaithful. And everything that can go wrong will. And the maintenance man is always late. I mean, just I, this doesn't take really a whole lot. You just look around, look at life. This is what's generally true. 
I, I, I say that because my air conditioner was out this week. He was going to come at 8. He came at 2.30. <laughs> 2 30. I was like, like a whole day later. I, I, I was like, what? I, okay. I mean, just, but that's just, I, I, should, I should know that, right? You should just know. Just look around. If I had made careful planning, I would just simply know you're going to be here all day. And anytime you have something broken in your house, you should just know I'm going to be here all day. I'm waiting on somebody else, <laughs> right? Do some inspection and understand the task that we have. The task at hand is huge. The task at hand is to build the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. That's a big task. The task of being committed followers of Jesus Christ is no small task. Understand, you, it will take some planning. You will not wake up in the morning, roll out of bed, and be holy. <laughs> you simply won't. It will take planning. It will take work. Right? Can I get an amen? Did anyone here roll out of bed this morning in perfect union with the holy God? Because I need to eat what you're eating. <laughs> I have to spend time in worship and in prayer and in my Bible. It's not how I wake up. I wake up thinking about me, myself, and I. It takes planning. It'll be take struggle. And I just want to give you three points. How do I plan for anything? And again, this goes in any kind of planning. How do you plan? How do I become a planful person? All right. Now, for those of you who are not planful, I'm going to have to tell you, write this down. All right. Because <laughs> you're not planful, so you won't think to write this down. But you should write this down. Three simple things. If you want to plan, first of all, focus, continual focus. If you have a plan, you need continual focus to keep going back to that focus. My plan to be a committed follower of Jesus Christ means that every day I spend time in prayer and in worship and Bible reading. I have to go back again and again and again and again. This is an application that works for any plan. Whatever you want to accomplish, you just keep looking at it and saying, this is what I want to get done. This is what I want to get done. This is what I want to get done. You just keep going back and back and back. This is my goal for 2015. This is my goal for the next 10 years. This is my goal for a family. This is my goal for our community. Whatever it is, keep going back. Continual focus. Secondly, lists. I just told you, write this down. Write it down. <laughs> Write it down. I don't know. I know most of you, and this is a sad statement, but it's true. Most of you have a better memory than me. <laughs> every thinking one of you, I think. I can't remember anything. So I write, literally write everything down. So, and I want to encourage you, write it down. Write it down. List things. I make a list every single day of my life. I swear, I do. I mean, even on a Sunday, when I basically my big task are to preach twice, right? <laughs> or to preach once if Pastor Glenn is preaching. I still write down, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. Maybe in between, I need to make sure this happens, whatever. I write things down. And I want to encourage you to make a list so that you get things done. Lastly, put it on your calendar. Put it on a calendar. Say, you know, I, you know just write over the top of the month of January. In January, I'm hoping to get this done. Sometimes, sometimes I literally put the same thing on weeks after week after week after week just to make sure I get it done. Because maybe I don't get it done that first week. So that second week, I'll go back to it and go, I didn't get that done. Sometimes we need to simply write these things down. So just those three simple things. Focus, list, calendars. All right. But there's more. How to plan. What was Nehemiah's plan? I have no idea of Nehemiah. Did he have a focus? Did he have a list? Did he have a calendar? I have no idea if he did any of that. But what I know is he did have a plan. And he's about to unload it on you. You ready? You ready for Nehemiah's plan? Verse 16. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing. I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest. Let's read it together. Who were to do all the work. <laughs> I just think that's funny. His plan, what was his plan? He was, his plan was to let other people work. His plan, now I don't want to say it, Nehemiah is not some sissy guy who sits behind a desk and says, would you go do some work? He is not that guy. Nehemiah is a man that you, as we read, he picks up the trowel. He picks up the sword. He is a hardworking man of God. He is not afraid, but his plan is partnership. His plan is to partner. And if you want to get something done, you need a partner. 
You need a partner. You need a partner. Every one of us. I need a partner. We need partners. I love it, though. It's really funny. He just, he didn't, I haven't told them yet. that they. And I love his faith there. Look at his faith. He just says, they're, they're going to partner with me on this. He was believing. He just, God will make this happen. He already gave me the materials. He already gave me a permission slip from the king. He already gave me a garrison of soldiers. These people are going to help us build this thing. Just watch. I love the faith. I love it. So partnership. And so then he does, he calls them into partnership. Verses 17 and 18, Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17. And this is great. If you are in a position of leadership, I want you to look at how he calls people into partnership. Because it does. It matters how we call people. It matters how we call them on board. Listen to what he does. He says, and I said to them, you see all the trouble. You see all the trouble we're in. We are in. How Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. And he, he starts out. He says, you see the trouble? You see the problem? Look around, brothers and sisters. You see the trouble, right? You see the trouble in Ohio. You see the tr trouble in Columbus. You see the trouble in Commercial Point. You see the trouble in the United States of America. You see the trouble. Amen? Amen. Come, let us build the wall. Let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. That, and I told them that the hand of God, and I love this because he goes into sharing a testimony here which is a great way to call people in with you, to call partners to join you in partnership. It's to remind them God is already at work. We really want you to join what God is doing. Look at what he says. He says, I told them how the hand of my God was upon me for good and also the words that the king had spoken to me. He, remind, he reminds everybody, he says, look, God is at work. Look what God is doing. We have a task. We have a task. And how do they respond? They said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. Partnership. Partnership. When we start this addition and when we start any task that matters, I don't care if you're simply trying to build a family. I don't care if you're trying to advance yourself in whatever career you're in, whatever your task is at hand, or if your task is as precious and beautiful and worthy as truly building the kingdom of God, you need partners. You need partners, and I need partners. I have had the privilege of having some great partners in life. I, I don't know if you've ever had any great partners. My wife is an amazing partner in my life. She's awesome in so many ways. My, my father, I'm so, I'm so privileged to work at South Point Church with my dad. Now, you don't know what that means to me. And he is an amazing partner in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the endeavor to glorify God through building the kingdom. He's an amazing partner. I love it. I have had the privilege to work with some amazing people in my life. I've also worked with some of those lazy bones that Proverbs 6.6 6 was talking about. Have you? Have you ever worked with some, some uh, partners that just, they weren't up to snuff? You remember, the, you remember the science project, biology class, and you had a partner? <laughs> Everybody wanted to be that one kid's partner, Right? And, everybody, and nobody wanted to be my partner. <laughs> no one wanted to be Tim's partner. Because in the end, it, you know, your partnership matters. It does. Who you partner with truly matters. You need a partner in raising kids and in living in obedience to Jesus Christ. You need a partner. We need partners in caring for the sick. We need partners in uh, building a community. We need partners in evangelizing the, the lost. We need partners sending missionaries all around the world. We need partners building the kingdom of God. We need partners. We can't do this alone. I can't do this alone. You can't do this alone. You know, in the New Testament, 
you never find the word saint. You know that? You never find saint. You know why? Because it's always saints. It's always saints. That's interesting. You know what that really says to me? It says to me what my life has already proven to me is there are no such thing as Lone Ranger Christians. You will not make it by yourself. You need partners. You need the body of Christ, brothers and sisters, to meet with, to have Bible study with, to have fellowship with, to, to come over to their house and eat pizza with freezing cold pool water. We need partners, <laughs> don't we? We do. We need partners, partners that, we'll just, that we'll, just, we'll just be in fellowship with. We need some partners. You can't do this alone. I just want to say that. You need Christian friends. You need Christian friends that will truly partner with you. Partner with you. Do you need a partner? Let me just, if you would admit that, all right? And I'm not, I'm just, I'm not asking if you, if you, like, I have some partners, all right? But I just want to admit right now, I need a partner. Would anyone else admit you need a partner? Raise your hand if you would just admit that. I need partners. I need partners in my family. I need partners in my worship. I need partners in every way I can find them. I need partners in walking the Christian walk. I need partners. Raise your hands again, everybody that said you need a partner. Just, all right, look around the room right now. Keep your hands up. Look around. Everybody's got their hands up saying, I need a partner. Guess what? You need a partner? Look around. They're right here. If you don't feel like you have a partner, I want to tell you, you're in a room full of people who want partners. We want partners. But I have to be honest, and you know this is true. Not everybody wants to be your partner. Do they? Huh? They don't all want to. Or is that just me? <laughs> I'm the only one that nobody wants. It's just since biology class all over again. <laughs> nobody wants to partner with Tim. They'll fail. <laughs> no, we, I mean, we all need a partner. But Nehemiah had the same. Nehemiah and me, we're in the same boat. They had people that didn't want to be partners with them. Look at verse 19. Verse 19 says... But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite, servant of Geshem the Arab, heard of it, they jeered us. They despised us. And they said, what is this thing you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? And if I as Nehemiah, I would have just, man, I wouldn't have been godly. I would have just jumped up and been like, no, I have a permission slip and a house that the king gave me, and I've got a garrison of soldiers, and I have all the supplies to build this bad boy temple. <laughs> that, but that's, that would not have been, uh, that may have been less godly than he expected. Right? <laughs> and Nehemiah is a better man than Pastor Tim. Nehemiah doesn't say that, but he does put them in their place. He does put them in their place because not everybody wants to be your partner. Not everybody wants to be your partner. Some people want to harm you. Some people want to oppose you. Some people will want to discredit you. Some people will refuse the prayerful, planful partnership that you offer. They'll, they'll, just, they'll, they'll not only jeer and mock, but they'll, just, they'll, just, they'll try to get other people to, to go away and to come away. Say, no, you don't want to be a part of this. This is a terrible idea. It'll probably all fall down. Verse 20. Then I replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper. And we, his servants, will arise and build. And you will have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. He may not have stuck his tongue out, but he did put them in their place because he recognized, you know what? We need partners, but some, in, in doing any great task, you will need to prune. You'll need to do some pruning. I don't care what task you're trying to accomplish, there will be people and things in your life that you will have to prune. So if people refuse the plan, the partnership, the, the planned part, prayerful partnership with you, you just say, bye-bye. 
Go ahead and say that with me. Say bye bye. Just say bye bye. Adios. Arrivederci. And any other languages that you know. See ya. You don't want to be a partner? Don't be a partner. You don't have to be. Actually, this is exactly why our church doesn't have a, a traditional membership role. We don't have a big list somewhere where we write everyone's name and number and all that stuff down. You know why we don't do that? Because the average church in the United States of America has a membership role three times. And this is the average. The average church in America has a membership role three times the size of its actual attendance. Why even have that thing? <laughs> so, so you know what we decided as a church we would do? Instead of making a role and trying to keep track, you know, who is a member, we just said, we'll describe a member. You decide if you're a member. Here, I'll describe a member for you. A member is someone who professes Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. A member is someone who attends the church, is active in the church, serves the church, and gives to the church. We give it to you. Are you a member? You decide. You decide if you're a partner. And if you're not, okay. That's fine. Don't partner. You don't want a partner? I'll take your blessing. <laughs> That's really what Nehemiah said. He says, you don't want your blessing? You don't want to be part of building the kingdom of God? I'll take it. <laughs> it's just like, you know, after you know, last night we were eating, my wife made some amazing nachos and um, I don't even know what it's like queso dip with meat in it and all this and it was really I mean it was silly good and I was I was I went up for thirds and my you know my son was kind of like you know I don't want any more of this I just reached over and said you don't want that <laughs> I will take it you don't want to you don't want this I'll have it you don't want to partner with the church I'll take it I will take it because partnership has privileges and that's what Nehemiah says it does Partnership has blessing. Partner with the church. Partner with the people of God, and there's blessings. There's blessings. But, like I said, but there are not all partners. There are a lot of prunes, aren't there? There are those that we truly need to prune from our life. In order to accomplish the task of living a godly life as a young man, I had to prune people and places from my life. And it wasn't their fault, it was mine. Because I couldn't be the person God wanted me to be in, with those people or in those places. I had to prune them. I had to say, I can't do this. I can't be here. I can't be your friend. I have to step back. Because it's not glorifying God. We have partners in life. And we truly have prunes. Let the partners be partners. And let the prunes be the prunes. And let me just say, I know the prunes demand a lot of time. Do you have some prunes in your life? The prunes take a lot of time, don't they? <laughs> Those people who should be pruned from our lives, but some, we can't prune all of the prunes. We have some prunes that they're family or some prunes that they're really close friends. Some of you, some of you might be a prune, and I'm not going to kick you out of the church. <laughs> so I have, to stay, I have to deal with you, right? I'm, not, I'm just not, you know, you just, you know, you may not be a real blessing, but, you know, you're not hurting anybody either. I'm not going to cut you out. I have to deal with you. You're part of the body of Christ. What part? I don't know. You're like the fingernails or something, that, like the dead part or the, you know, this, the skin that's coming. I don't know what you are. But, I mean, there's, 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 there's this, you know, there are some some people that should be pruned, but we can't prune. And I just want to encourage you, spend more time with your partners than you do your prunes. Have more conversations with your partners than you do your prunes. Partners. Partners are how we will start well. Partners are, is how we will accomplish the task of building a kingdom for God. I want to close this morning simply saying, if you want to complete the task, whatever task you have, you'll need to do four things. You'll need to pray. You'll need to plan. You'll need to partner. And you'll need to do some pruning. And today, as we, we dedicate this land, that's what we're going to do. We're going to call you. Would you be a partner with the church? I told you, we have a sign-up over there. We have seven days. Seven Sat well, six Saturdays and one, and one holiday, Labor Day, that we're calling friends to partner with the church and saying, will you help us build this addition? Literally, will you paint? Will you spackle? Will you do mulch? Will you do all these things? Will you partner? 
Will you partner? We're going to start with prayer, just dedicating that space to the Lord. And we're going to plan. We're going to continue to plan, not just work days, but we're going to continue to plan uh, Awana and all the ministries that will happen in that place in 2015, 2016. Now, I, I don't want to, uh, you know what, I understand some of you, you know, I'm not going to give you the out and say, you know, I know some of you go, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm just here, I'm a visitor, or I'm, I, you know, whatever, and I'm just saying, you know what, You're, I'm not calling you a prune if you don't sign up today, but I am asking you this. It's not about this task. It's about the task. We are here to build the kingdom of God. Will you partner with a body of Christ to build it? You don't have to build this one, but build something for the glory of God. Can I get an Amen. amen. That we would build the kingdom and that we would pray in a revival in Ohio and in this country. That is our prayer. That is what we are praying for. That's what we're planning for. And that's what we're calling you. Will you be a partner with us? Let's pray. Father, we.